Welcome to episode four of my RC374 Honda replica build. In this episode, I'm gonna be showing you how I made the frame, built up the rolling chassis, and made a few ancillary components. And in episode three, I showed you how I made the wheels, the front hub from a solid billet of aluminium, the front and rear sub assemblies, and then we started the engine on the bench for the first time. With the engine running and the front and rear sub assemblies complete, the next thing I needed to do was make a frame. I wanted the frame to be roughly the same as the real Honda RC174, so I bought a model maker's guide to making one. And this gave me the critical dimensions, albeit a bit small, but I just scaled them up by my known size, which was the outside diameter of the wheel rim. I then measured the angle for the steering head and the angle of the engine leaning forward, the distances between the rear wheel spindle, the swing and arm pivot, and the engine sprocket, and from that I could make my frame jig. So the first thing I did was to make the bracket that supports the engine and bolts the swing and arm to the rear wheel so I can make up a rear sub-assembly. Using a spare set of crankcases, I made some cardboard templates, rested the crankcases on a plastic bucket and some blocks of aluminium and a bit of wood and lined it all up with bits of string to get it in the right place and then marked out the three holes so I can make a really good template. I traced around the templates onto some steel sheet, went out in the garden and cut out the shapes with my angle grinder and then welded it up together with some pieces of tube going through to support the forces from the bolts. I then bolted each bracket assembly to the engine and welded in the crossbar spacers. And then I formed a piece of steel to wrap around and welded it in place to complete the casing and then bolted in the rear swing and arm and bolted it to the engine and that tied the back wheel to the engine in the right position. I could even put on the chain just to make sure it all lined up. With a dummy set of crankcases bolted to the rear end, I now had a complete rear sub-assembly so I was ready for my frame jig that I'd welded up out of some box section and strip. All the key dimensions were worked out from my model maker's guidebook. I then bolted the crankcases and rear swing and arm assembly into the frame jig and offered up the front end. With the front and rear sub assemblies bolted onto my frame jig, I double checked the wheelbase and it was correct for the RC174 and also the engine inclination was correct. And so the next thing I needed to do was make up some dummy tubes to join the headstock to the rear frame rails so I can get these made out of T45 chrome manganese steel. I made the dummy frame rails out of some old exhaust pipe just so I could see and feel the shape and make sure it all looked right and from that I was able to make some cardboard templates so I could trace round into a drawing. To save a bit of time I just took a photograph of the drawing with my iPhone, sent the image to a company in Birmingham and had these pipes bent up and a couple of days later they arrived and I was well pleased, they looked really amazing. And because they were done on the CNC hydraulic bender they were perfect mirror images of each other. I placed the tubes onto the lower subframe and they dropped down exactly in the right place under the headstock. I just needed to trim them down and file them in a half round file to make them fit the headstock tube. So with them clamped in place, I marked them out with my Sharpie pen, took them to the device and filed them to fit until I got them fitting just right. And here they are resting in place, all ready for tack welding. So the next thing I did was clamp the frame rails in place with 4G clamps and I checked with the spirit level they were level and the central bar was temporarily in place just to make sure it was all in line down the length of the bike. Then a last check by eye just to make sure and I was all ready for welding. I then bent up some tubes for the rear subframe using my model maker's guidebook as a reference and welded them in place. Just there and just there. I then welded in place the top frame tube that comes down from the headstock to the first cross member, welded, welded the second cross member in place and lined up the rear of the top frame rails so I could weld in the dropper bar that goes from the top shock mount down to the swing and arm pivot. And these I machined upon my milling machine. The next thing I had to do was make the two rear footrest hangers. I marked them out on a sheet of steel and went out back out into the garden to cut them out of my angle grinder. Each of the footrest hangers comprises of an inner and outer plate with a hole drilled in them and a tube inserted and welded and then a thin strip welded all around the outside to complete them. I'll be welding the rear footrest hangers onto the bike at a later stage but for now I wanted to make the hoop that joins the rear frame rails. I found an old set of crash bars that were just the right size so I cut a section out and welded it in place. I was well pleased. The frame was really taking shape now and I was almost ready to bolt the engine in place but before I could do that I needed to make the top frame mounts for the shock absorbers. 
I made the top shock absorber mounting brackets in a similar fashion to the footrest hangers by welding two plates together with a joining strip and a hole drilled through both sides and a big bar welded in for the shock absorber mount. I adjusted the fit with my file so it fit with the frame tubes just perfect ready for welding. I lifted the engine down and bolted it into the frame and it fitted perfect. I put the top and bottom rear engine bolts in place and then I can make the front tubes that drop down and bolt onto the front of the engine. I was excited to fit the six headers so I could get a proper look from the front to see how it's going to look and it looked amazing. With the rolling chassis basically complete, the next thing I was going to do was make the six exhausts. But before I can really make the exhaust, I've got a weld on the footrest hanger, make the footrest, make the gear lever and make the brake pedal. So this is how I made the gear lever. Wow, I can hear such a lot of noise coming from the kitchen. I think Tracy's doing some more cooking. So I go in to have a look and she's making a fruit cake. I was well amazed how she does it. She sort of gloops it into a tin, gives it a bit of a squidge with a spoon, whizzes it around, puts it in the oven, leaves it for about half an hour or so and gets it out and it smells amazing. But it's well too hot to eat. But luckily she'd made some cupcakes and they cool off so quickly and I was able to take one. I don't think she noticed. Hello? Hello? No, 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 no. You, no, we're not selling cupcakes. No, you can't have two dozen. Now we don't ship to Sweden either. Okay, thank you. Bye. The first thing I need to do is cut an internal spline on a piece of aluminium and the easiest way to do this is to get an old gear shaft, put it in your lathe, turn down a little bit of a lead at the front and then you can press it into the aluminium and form the spline. So I turn the diameter of the shaft down to the root of the spline and then measure it with my micrometer to see what the actual size is and it turns out just under 12 millimetres which is perfect because I can drill a 12 millimetre hole in the aluminium. I'm going to make the gear lever out of a bit of 10 millimetre thick 6082T6 aluminium bar. So the first thing I need to do is trim off the end square. With the end bit trimmed off, I put it back in the vise and file it up to make it nice and square. With the top filed flat, I just deburr the edges and check it's square with my set square, then I can mark out the hole centres. And that'll do just nicely. The next thing I do is mark out the centre line using my dividers. So I scratch one line sort of slightly over halfway, then scratch another line slightly over halfway, then divide the two to get the centre. The next thing I do is position the gear change shaft and the clamping bolt so I can mark their centres using my dividers. With the centre lines marked, the next thing I need to use is my dot punch to mark the centres for drilling. With the whole centres dot punched, the next thing I'm going to do is drill two pilot holes of around 3mm. It's important to drill a small pilot hole first. This helps to prevent the main size drill from wandering. 
With both the pilot holes drilled, the next thing I'm going to do is drill the clamping hole to 5mm, which is the tapping size for an M6 thread. Then I'm going to drill the 12mm hole for the gear shaft spline. And that's just perfect. The shaft goes in, but the spline doesn't, because what we're going to do next is put a bit of oil on the, on the hole and a bit of oil on the spline shaft, and we're going to squeeze them together in my vise to form a spline in the aluminium. It's quite hard going, and although you can actually do it in the vise, so I have done it before, it's much easier in your 40 ton press. So I take it out of my vise and put it in my hydraulic press and it squeezes it through like butter. And there we go, the shaft is pressed through the aluminium, forming its way through a nice spline. So what we do now is knock it out with my hammer, and there it is, that's the first stage of the spline complete. So what I'm gonna do now is cut down with a hacksaw to split the clamping point. I'll make a cut about one millimeter off center, so there's slightly more material on one side for the thread than there is on the opposite side, which will be drilled out to clearance. So the right side is a thicker side, so that'll be threaded, and the left side is going to be drilled out with a 6mm drill to clear the thread. So with a 6mm drill in the chuck, I carefully drill down until I get to the centre line. So with the clearance hole drilled, the next thing to do is to tap the 6mm thread. Then I put it in my vise and give it a little deburr with a file to remove any burrs. With the burrs removed, the next thing I want to do is put a 45 degree chamfer on the spline on both sides so that it engages easier with the shaft. Just like one millimetre by one millimetre is just fine. So with the chamfer done, I put the shaft back in the gear lever, and tap it with a hammer a few times, and this burnishes the spline and makes it really shiny. So when it's tapped out, it looks like it's been freshly machined. And now the shaft fits perfect, and I'm well pleased with that spline. It looks amazing. So the last thing I do is put in the clamp bolt, put the shaft back in, and do it up with a spanner, just to see if it all fits and goes tight, which it does. So that's just perfect. So the gear lever is now all ready for machining on the Miller machine and welding on the tow bit. I mill the back a bit with my milling machine to reduce its thickness in places, then make up a toe piece and weld that on. And here's the finished gear change lever, all ready to fit. The gear lever fits perfect on the bike, and here you can see the rear footrests made and the hangers welded onto the frame. The brake pedal is made in a similar fashion from aluminium plate, hand cut out and filed. The pyramid effect knurl I did on the actual pedal was done by files. So what you do, you file it one way down to a depth, then you go at 90 degrees down to the same depth and you'll get loads of little pyramids, which looks quite authentic. And here's the finished foot brake and footrest on the left hand side already. So now I'm all set to make the exhausts. I hope you enjoyed the video. In episode five, I'll be showing you how I made the exhausts. So don't forget to like and subscribe.